the second prez family and guests i am sorry if you are uh, hearing this for the first time but my family has some big news this uh this summer my wife stacy and i will be moving to paris france last uh, last sunday in fact i was outside at our 11 o'clock service in the courtyard when a notification buzzed on my phone and the interim pastor of the American church in Paris was texting me to congratulate me on that congregation's calling me to be their next senior pastor. They called me to be their next senior pastor. Now, that doesn't mean they picked up the phone and made a, a call. It, it, it means that of the candidates that they, they looked at, the people that they researched, they prayed about, and the sermons they listened to, they discerned a sense of call upon me. And as I talked with them and talked with Stacy and my family, I sensed a call to go there and to be with them. And, and as, what, as happens typically with pastoral calls, there's typically a third body, a, a middle judicatory of one fashion or another that has an objective view that says, yes, we affirm that that is a call and that has happened here as well. Then of course, God's a part of it all, right? God is in and through it, and we sense that just because I've got a crazy idea or a dream or you do doesn't necessarily mean it's God's call, but when you start to see those vectors intersect, you can say, no, this seems like it's something God is up to. And when God calls you, when there's a calling upon your life, whether it's for something you're supposed to do today or this season or the next few years or for a lifetime, that's something that you do your best to say yes to. And you don't say yes to God's call upon your life or upon a season of your life because if you don't, you'll get in trouble or God will be mad at you. That's not the kind of God that we have at all. The reason you listen for and you seek to be obedient to the call of God upon your life is because it means you get to play. It means you get to play a significant part, one of many multitude, millions of parts in enacting God's will and God's way in the world, you get to be a part of the transformation of creation, the reconciliation of all life to God. That's a wonderful thing to be a part of. That's a wonderful call to say yes to, and each of us, each one of us, has that call upon our lives. So this morning, I want to talk about this, this shift for a second, this shift for me, this idea of God's call upon our lives as it relates to our summer worship series, the Silver Linings Pandemic Playbook. And one of the things that we have learned this past year is that when big news comes out, if that news isn't clear, if that news isn't consistent, if leadership is not on board as to what exactly the news is and on board with how that news is rolled out, the response to unexpected news can feel chaotic. And we've learned that nothing, nothing loves a void like fear and conspiracies. And so I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page in terms of my upcoming departure from Second Presbyterian. Sadly, a number of us have been through a lot of not so great senior pastor departures. And so just to be clear, I'm not leaving Second because there has been any sort of scandal I'm not leaving second because you have underpaid me. I'm not leaving second because the church is unhealthy. I'm not leaving because there's some massive financial problems on the horizon. I'm not leaving because I'm being pushed out. What are the other reasons why it is that you've seen pastors leave? Just, just, to, just want to kind of hear them. Any other reasons? Any other conspiracies floating out there? It's just not them. As much as we'd like to kind of project sometimes into the void and wonder what it is, the fact is, this is a really good kind of leaving. This is because God has called me somewhere, and I feel like second is in a place where in the past I didn't feel like I could leave. I feel like I'm at a place now where I can leave second, and second has a calling. Each one of you have a calling unto whatever the next thing is. I remember hearing an interview with David Letterman and somebody said to him, um, when will you know, you know, after having this fantastic run on, on late night TV, when will you know that it's time for you to kind of hang up your spurs and to step away? And he said, uh, 
you know, I have a pretty good idea that I will know. I'll have a very clear sense as to when it's time for me to step away. And probably everyone else will have a clear sense as to when it's time for me to step away. And he goes, at that point, I'll probably stay another 10 years. Um, and then I'll quit. We've all been a part of communities where it was clear that a transition was at foot. And people resisted it or denied it and stayed longer than they needed to. Some callings are for a season, and if the end of a calling is difficult, that's probably reaffirmation that the calling in the first place was a good one. When I came here 11 years ago, I was 42, just finishing my doctorate. Stacy and I had a second grader, a fourth grader, and an eighth grader. All of you, in different ways, loved and helped nurture my family, you cared for us, you loved us, you encouraged us. 11 years ago you called me because you intentionally looked for a pastor who would help you to lean into the future. In my experience and expertise in 21st century church leadership, meshed with your desires for where you wanted the church to go and you worked with me in these last 11 years to go through some pretty deep valleys and ascend some pretty amazing mountaintops. We've made some big changes together in this congregation. You've made me into the pastor that I am today and the leader and the servant that I am. I'm wiser, I'm grayer, I'm humbler, I'm more in love with Jesus, and I'm a little less concerned about if everyone loves me or not but I am very much in love with this congregation. And this will be a very hard leaving for me. The, um, the thing is though, I think you are, as I said, experiencing the best kind of senior pastor leaving the best kind of leaving that a church can ask for. I, I wish I could have experienced more of these kind of leavings when I was younger or when I was an associate pastor and the senior pastor left. Just a reminder, you have recently completed a $3 million capital campaign with no debt. You have a facility that is ready to welcome the vision that God has given you to be a crossroads for Christ in this important part of Kansas City. You've recently completed a year-long self-study and reaffirmed your identity, your shared values, your mission, and your vision, and you've taken huge strides already to advance Jesus' great commandment and great commission to love and to go. You've got an amazing, creative, experienced, wise set of women and men who lead your church on your elder and deacon board. You've got a, a veteran staff from top to bottom, very talented, Second is well positioned within our presbytery and denomination. We're seen as a leading congregation and our collaboration with other churches and communities and our generosity and our leadership in birthing new church communities. Second has a renewed focus and commitment to connecting with our city and our brothers and sisters of different racial and ethnic backgrounds who are opening our eyes to the injustices that we must address together for Christ's sake and the way that they can breathe life and beauty upon us and help us to see more clearly beyond the homogenous narrative to a more beautiful and diverse sense of God's call and God's will and God's way. This is a vital congregation. Of course, we've got work to do, but we're blessed. If you're on Zoom, just look in gallery view. If you're here in the sanctuary, just, just look around. You are an amazing group of people. And here at Second, we don't just talk about the priesthood of believers. We live it. There's a great group of leaders sitting around you. And each one of you, each one of you, is called by God. I also want to share with you a little bit this morning about this, this church that I have said yes to. The... Um, the American Church in Paris, is that up there? Is the, uh, is the oldest 
American congregation outside of the United States. It's been in a couple of locations. Its most recent one is on the Quai d'Orsay. It's an amazing location, a crossroads itself at an international city. It used to be primarily a church for expats and, and people who were in Paris for a little bit of time, but in the last 10 or 15 years, it has transitioned and the congregation has become more stable and more people that live in Paris. Roughly about a third of the congregation at this point are people who grew up in Africa or African descent, about a third East Asian and a third European or expat. I was told by the previous pastor who was there, who was a friend of mine, that every time he looked out on a communion Sunday, he felt like he was getting a taste of heaven. They have an active ministry to immigrants, to schools that meet on their property. They host language classes, community events of all sorts. When American diplomats are in town, that's where they worship. It is a well-connected, well-respected, talented community. And the main reason that they decided to call me as their next pastor is because of you. I couldn't fly over there. I couldn't meet with them directly, so they spent a lot of time on our website. They watched everything that Second has been doing for the last 10 years. They read our mission statement. They watched videos of all of you. They read our annual reports. They were impressed. They were impressed to see what you have done here, what we have done here, with our adaptability, the way we have pivoted, our commitment to being an anti-racist community, all the ways we have leaned into the future of the church. You are an impressive congregation, near and far. And it's time for you to take advantage of this historic time, this change in our world, and lean into the next decade with a different kind of servant leadership, and I'm excited for you. I want to close and invite Jim Mueller to come forward in just a minute. But I want to close by sharing with you the text, the scripture verse that God gave me about six weeks ago from John chapter 15. It's a text that God um, spoke to me through about six weeks ago, and ever since then I cut it and I pasted it into my Google Calendar, and it wakes me up every morning with a little notification at 8 a.m., I have chosen you from the world to go and bear fruit that will endure. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give to you. Here is my commandment. This is my commandment. Love each other. I have chosen you, each one of you, God says, Jesus says, I have chosen you, Nancy. I have chosen you, Bill. I have chosen you, Matt, from the world to go and bear fruit that will endure. You did not choose me, but I have chosen you. This, um, this was a difficult year. No one would argue with that. And we needed to, we were called to care for ourselves and others. And in order to obey Jesus' commandment, to love each other, what we had to do was stay home and stay safe, stay apart. And if you are immunocompromised, if you haven't been able to get your vaccines yet, your calling is still to stay apart, to stay home, to stay safe, find other ways to engage. But for many of us, friends, it's time to reemerge. For many of us, it's time to perk our ears up and engage our hearts once again because God is calling. If you start hear, hearing that still small voice calling you back into the community, friends, that means it's time. For many of us, it's time to go bear fruit that will endure again. What we don't want to do 
And what God doesn't desire for us is that our desire to love each other by withdrawing transforms into languishing. I'm afraid that is happening in different parts of our world and our country. Friends, we've been called by God to go. Called to go and bear fruit. Fruit that will endure. And you don't go alone. The reason the fruit endures is because your little part meshes with my little part, meshes with their little parts, and together everyone else enacts God's commandment to go and to love. This is our call. And as we hear the call upon our lives, it is our responsibility to respond. Call and response. That's the rhythm that God weaves into creation. Friends, what is God calling you to today? What has God been calling you to the last few weeks? What does God have in store for you in this next season? I invite you to lean into that. I invite you to respond so that together each one of us can do our part to bring that reconciliation, that healing, that love that this world so desperately needs. It's up to us, friends. Hear the call. Respond. Re-engage. It's time. Amen.